Hi, my name is Kevin Lindegaard of Crops for Energy and um, we're here in Umberley Barton Farm in Devon. It's uh, mid-November and I'm doing a bird survey with Ed Druitt, a wildlife uh, guru and ornithologist. So what, what are we doing, uh, Ed? Well, basically, uh, this evening and tomorrow morning, we are walking around the willow plantations and recording what birds we see and hear. So I've got my map here and I'm writing them down on the map to get a sense of what birds are using the willow plantations, what are using the hedgerows and the fields nearby. And, and obviously in this case, we're just getting a snapshot of the bird life that is potentially using a willow plantation like this in the winter time. So we're walking here from a transition of one-year-old willow into quite a mature plantation. Chances are we'll see some uh, different things um, in here, hopefully. Now already on this stubble field to the right of us here, there are about 500 starlings that are actually feeding in the field. I've also had about 30 linnets. So what I'm very interested in is how this willow plantation here actually is perhaps being used by some of these birds. I've got my clipboard here, I've got a map of the site and what I'm doing is I'm writing the birds that we see in here down but I'm doing it in a special code that is used by the British Trust for Ornithology on their breeding bird surveys um, and in essence really most, well all birds really have been shortened to one or two letters so a robin for example is R dot, wren is W R, blackbird is B dot and it's just a really good shorthand way of being able to record birds where you might have lots of them on a map together there's also some other signs in here. So if the bird is singing, like a robin singing, I'll put a circle around it. If I'm hearing the bird just making a kind of squeaky call or a kind of tacking sound, I'll put an underline under it, which means that it was calling. And if we've got some birds flying overhead, I'll put a diagonal arrow through the codes, which indicates that it was flying overhead. And this is just a really good way then of when you get back to analyze this data, of having a lot of information in a kind of a small space. Now wildlife loves connectivity and it's important to see how this willow plantation fits in with the wider landscape. Just behind me here we've got this fantastic kind of copse area really of oak trees and then the railway line which has a really lovely corridor. Now corridors are really good because it means wildlife can move up and down these corridors to cover, there's food for them. And then beyond that there is a strip of mature woodland, oak and ash primarily, this willow is all part of a mosaic environment, which is what's really important for wildlife. That's what it really wants. And wildlife also loves edge habitat. So again, the edge of the plantation here, the edge of the railway line, the edge of the woodland are all great places where you're going to find not just your small stuff, your invertebrates, but your bigger stuff such as your birds. The bramble here is really important actually because it provides good food places for birds, feeding on the berries, feeding on the insects that are coming to the flowers. It also provides nesting places for birds. But if we go just a layer down from them to the invertebrates, this is also a really good place where creatures such as lacewings and ladybirds and insects called um, parasitoids, which lay their eggs inside caterpillars that can be pests, for example, tend to hibernate during the winter time. So having the bramble here is really good because it means that all those kind of predatory invertebrates are living here. They provide food for birds, but also they then predate on the insects that might well be feeding on some of the nearby arable crops. It's amazing. You look at these trees and you think there's nothing here, but the long-tailed tits and goldcrests are really good at looking for those tiny things. Mites, spiders, scale insects. They'll work their way along the branches here looking for the eggs from butterflies and moths that will be here. There might be the chrysalises that are just camouflaged on the stems but the birds, the long-tailed tits and goldcrests are very good at finding them. And I can hear a woodpecker, a great spotted woodpecker in the background just going chick. We're just between the willow plantations at the moment and, and what's really exciting really is just to see what farm the birds are on the outskirts of these willow plantations. So actually just over uh, beyond the railway there there's at least 20 skylarks. Really good to see. At this time of the year in November they're very much a wintering flocking bird really so they're going around as a group looking for food. 
Uh, and again, they're probably going to be most likely to rest and roost on the ground in those fields, but it could well be that this willow plantation is still providing some cover for them. It'll be interesting to see once the sun goes down a little bit later, we've still got a couple of hours yet before dusk, uh, what some of these birds that are feeding in the nearby fields actually do and, and whether some of them appear to come over towards the willow plantation. Or not. We've got about 30, 10, 20, 30, 30 red wings going over. These birds will be feeding on invertebrates like earthworms during the day, they'll be feeding on berries. But again, this type of willow plantation is the sort of place where um, they might come in to roost uh, in, a, in a couple of hours time or so. But certainly the fact that we've had pipe wagtail, grey wagtail, skylark, linnet, starling, really good to see already, you know, half a dozen kind of farmland bird species that across wider farmland are declining but certainly seem to be here in reasonable numbers. So uh, we're going to keep searching and see what else we can spot. The light's starting to fade a little bit now. The time is, well, almost four o'clock in the afternoon. And for a lot of birds that have been feeding during the daytime, it's time to think about coming into roost. And actually, they've just moved off the wires there, but a moment ago, there was about 60 linnets on the wires. And I suspect that they have been coming in to roost in the willow here or certainly some of the kind of more denser trees around us here there's also in the field next door been about a thousand starlings and they've just got spooked by a, a sparrowhawk and they've not come back just at the moment just watching what these linnets are up to we've got another flock of linnets that have just come in probably about 30 or so just on the wires above the willow i certainly saw some just drop down into the younger stuff and a lot of this younger stuff has got a lot more leafage on it and um, perhaps it's going to provide a bit more cover, denser cover for them. It's quite a breezy night tonight as well. So um, they're probably just wanting to uh, secure a good place in there, I suspect. So we're just getting close to where the linnets drop down from the wires. And actually looking at it here, you can see it's a very dense area of willow. This particular type of willow has still got its leaves, so they're still hanging on. It's a grey heron just flying overhead at the same time and I can hear the linnets in here I can make them hear them making little calls but it's a great dense place for them to have a nest they're nice and safe in here if there's a sparrowhawk around which might eat them it's actually going to be quite difficult for a sparrowhawk to be able to get in there and, and catch something so hopefully they're going to have a good night despite the wind <laughs> so we're here early morning it's getting on towards eight o'clock, the sun's risen now. The birds are just starting to become a little bit more active. We're just on the edge of the mixed willow plantation here. On my left hand side, we've actually got some lovely kind of scrubby habitat with some larger oak trees and the rowie line. On this side, quite a lot of bramble and willow. We are hearing a number of different song thrushes calling it actually in the plantation. We've just had a gold crest, which is our smallest bird in Britain, along with the fire crest, uh, move between the willow plantation and cross over into some of, the, some of the scrubby habitat here. And there's definitely lots of different sounds of birds such as robins and wrens coming from the plantation itself. Overhead, there's things like field fares, red wings, missile thrushes. They don't appear to be actually using the plantation itself, but certainly are part of the kind of wider habitat. Definitely a lot more sound than when we were surveying last night in the evening time. We've got a, a lovely mosaic of habitat around here with the willow as part of it. But what could you do to make it even better? What would be the, the gold standard? How can we make birds use this all, all year round, um, what would be the best thing? What, what will we do? Well, I think the word that you used right at the start then was mosaic. So at the moment, there's a mosaic environment kind of surrounding the willow plantation. And the willow trees are kind of part of that. And the birds appear to be kind of moving between the willows and the other habitats as a, as a kind of corridor, which is brilliant. But the stands of willows themselves, although there, there's a number of different species in here, it's obviously still quite a similar sort of um, habitat really and what you want to introduce perhaps are um, stands or bands within those willows that are of other species that might provide different types of food different types of cover and also perhaps introducing some more open spaces wildlife loves open spaces when a bit of sunlight's coming in and allows other plants to grow so actually if you've got some 
open spaces within perhaps the middle or, or different sections of those stands that can create just a slightly different uh, microclimate. Perhaps you can introduce um, some different sorts of plants that might be very good for insects, may be very good for pollinators, may be very good for producing fruits such as berries um, or apples, for example. And the other thing is water. So actually introducing different types of ponds, small, medium-sized ponds, don't have to be huge, that actually allow birds and other wildlife to come down and have a drink. Even things like honeybees need a drink and will come down during very hot weather. But I think it's about looking at how these stands of trees can become themselves more more varied and a, and a mosaic within within themselves and i think that sort of thing is what you're looking for to bring this up to sort of a gold standard mm -hmm.